So, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another video from me. Uh, for those that don't know who I am, maybe you've stumbled upon my content by, by just pure chance and circumstance. Uh, I'm Joe Harvey. I'm a freelance rugby union journalist. Uh, and I do some bits and bobs, but today I'm here to talk about something in particular. This is my as yet untitled MLR show. Which actually did just start off as a joke. I just literally said one day I have an as yet untitled MLR kind of... No, it's not a show. I think shows would be a bit too grandiose for it, but... It is MLR. I'm going to be talking about Major League Rugby. For those who don't know, Major League Rugby is the professional rugby competition in North America. Simple as, really. And after over a year of being away, over a year of, of being away, it's coming back this weekend. And I'm very fortunate to be part of the competition as a, um, well, I'm an MLR correspondent. And it, it's, it's one of the proudest things that I get to do on a week-to-week -week basis. And it... it for, you know, it's difficult to explain just how important the competition is because it's, it's for example, if you look at the top league in Japan, um, yeah, yeah, I think the top league in Japan is 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 usually my kind of way to the, to kind of compare it. If you look at the top league in Japan and what that has done for the Japanese national side, it it's huge. It's unbelievable what it's done for the Japanese national side, and then we saw that in two thousand nineteen at the two thousand nineteen World Cup. Then getting to the quarterfinals and even beating South Africa four years prior in Brighton, it all has relevance to the top league, to having a professional competition in your country in order to to give domestic players the opportunities to play, well, professional rugby, but also be in and around these guys that are just literally world class individuals. And MLR does have some of these world class individuals, and I'll be going into that um, pretty shortly. And I do have a. I'm sure you've seen from the title and uh, description and stuff like that. I do actually have a very special guest for this one who I'm, you know, really itching to, for you to, to watch that interview. But before that, unfortunately, you got to, uh, to kind of put up with me rambling for a while. Um, I'm sorry I didn't dress for the occasion. I've literally just, well, well, I got in from work. Uh, I was covering Coventry versus Ealing in, in Cove. And I literally got in an hour ago. Uh, <laughs> eaten my dinner, just kind of had a bit of a sit and uh, a think, and then realised that I am going to record this because it's been something on my mind all week uh, and it has to be done at some point, so why doesn't it, why shouldn't it go out on Saturday morning? So, firstly, I'm just going to go through the games this weekend be, and then I'm going to give context to the teams and, and, you know, maybe some of the familiar faces that you'll know because I'm imagining, unfortunately, that a lot of, well, not unfortunately, but what I mean by that is that I'm imagining that a lot of my audience is going to be UK and, and kind of traditional rugby nations based. So I just kind of want to explain who some of the bigger names are. But I'm also going to try and bring into that as best I can some of the kind of local players who are going to be applying their trade for Major League Rugby sides this season. So I'm just going to go through the schedule for week one, which has already had an adjustment because of COVID, but everything's updated. So I'm going to try and give you my best kind of estimates of of time difference as well because I am wholly useless wholly useless uh, so the season was due to kick off with Old Glory DC at Noel Gold but obviously because of a Covid situation unfortunately that's not gonna be the case so instead and I think this is still a great game to be kicking off the season with we are going to be kicking off with Rugby United New York at San Diego Legion. San Diego Legion, who aren't playing in San Diego this season because of COVID, they're playing at Cashman Field, which is in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, and then obviously New York, two pretty iconic kind of situations we've got there. Sorry, we've just got a call coming in. Get rid of that, that's fine. Um, taking place at the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. The LA Gil... Ooh, I completely messed that one up. The LA Giltinis will be hosting the New England Free Jacks. However... The, the, a lot of the Giltinis chat is going to come uh, with my interview with Sean McNulty, who's coming off the bench for that game. Um, the, the team's getting announced as we speak, so if I do actually neglect to mention a, an individual or, or a team, that is genuinely the reason why. Um, so yeah, New England have travelled over to LA for that one. Then after that, well, the thing is, some of the kickoffs, the kickoffs are quite staggered. So, well, not as staggered as you'd think, to be honest, because the first game is at 6pm Eastern, the second 6.30, the third 7pm, and then two kick off at 8pm Eastern, 
and then the other one on the Sunday, which is the game that's been adjusted because of COVID, uh, that is a Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern. So that's probably the most friendly, well, not friendly, not probably, it is the most friendly uh, for, for people watching over here in England in particular. Obviously, I've, because I'm English or I've grown up in England and, and a lot of my friends in England, in England uh, that's probably going to be the one you're going to be able to watch. Uh, I'm not sure what the kind of broadcast is at the moment because the rugby network isn't written below that fixture. Um, but if you can, download the rugby network, uh, download the MLR app as well, um, which which are just two tremendously exciting things that have occurred. Just before I, I kind of head into those those games and look at the teams, uh, I'm just going to very quickly, <laughs> as quickly as I can, pull up the law adjustments for Major League Rugby this season, which was kind of, it wasn't left field or anything like that, but it was certainly just kind of, it was it was an announcement that took place, so I'm recording this on Friday, so it was Thursday, it was last night, yeah. Um, and I, you know, I, I think law adjustments do have their place because the whole point of them is literally just to make the game more exciting in the long run. Whether or not they are laws that are introduced long term, you know, we still don't know. But anyway, here they are. There's a kick clocks, so kickers now have 60 seconds as opposed to 90 seconds for any kick, um, which is conversion slash penalty. Uh, and they will have a kick clock. That's going to be a trouble for some commentators. So have fun with that one, Dan and Dallin. Um, in order to guide them under the post rule, which means seven points will be automatically awarded for any score, uh, any try scored directly under the post, and no conversion will be necessary. Uh, this is one. This is one of the ones I've seen the most debates about because obviously people want, you know, you fly halves to get the decent stats and this, that, and the other. Well, your kickers actually is probably the more appropriate way to say it. Uh, scrum resets. Referees will work with stricter protocols that will limit the number of scrums to pump two per incident, which I think it means that you're only allowed one reset. And if you mess up that second reset, a penalty is just given either way. Yeah, which is a reset for collapse, penalty or free kick. Uh, then offside line. The offside line will be the feed line slash channel of the scrum to allow for unimpeded access to the ball at the back of the scrum for the attacking team. So again, that's just something in order to do to create a bit more space to allow a bit of crash ball, this, that and the other. And then red cards. This is probably one of the ones that people are going to talk about the most in the, in the entire thing. It, it's one we're seeing in Super Rugby AU at the moment, which is no longer will a red card mean that a team plays a man down for the remainder of the match. Under the new law, a red card would lead to a player being sent off and the team goes down to 14 players for 20 minutes. After the 20 minutes, the player can be replaced with another player on the bench. So please have a debate about those. Please do. And honestly, yeah. Please, please do kind of have a do it with that. So I've just seen Simon Shaw's... Simon Shaw's just tweeted me. I, I lead a slightly bizarre life. Anyway. <laughs> games. So we're starting off with Rugby United in New York at San Diego. Let's talk about Rugby United in New York at the moment. Obviously, they're... Well, not obviously, because this might be some people's first introduction to Major League Rugby. Um, their head coach, Greg McWilliams, recently stepped aside from the team in order to carry out, you know... Well, <clears throat> not to carry out, but in order to... You know, focus on family stuff because I know that his wife has has had a battle with uh, with breast cancer in the last month, in the last year or so. So, and then that in combined with two young children and um, you know wanting to to spend as much time with them as possible, Greg Greg steps aside from uh, New York. So you know, all the best to him, and I know he follows me, uh, and I look forward to having a catch up because I understand that there's plenty in the pipeline for you at the moment and I can't wait to see what you do next with a with a team or whatever you decide to do because I, I already know that you're going to do brilliant with whatever that is. A lot of people will know of New York because they already do have uh, an English superstar on their roster which is Ben Foden obviously for many years playing for Northampton Saints, England etc 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 but then some of the other guys that people may not know um, that would be I mean Andy Ellis, who won the World Cup in 2011, he's a pretty good name, isn't he? Um, he he's one of those that he he's been playing in Japan for for pretty much the last seven years, and and after COVID, he he was happy to to hang up the boots, but then when the opportunity of New York kind of came up, he he jumped at it. So I'm just trying to see what my battery life is, but we will never know apparently. Um, in terms of other names, we may know Charlie Hewitt, who used to play for Worcester Warriors in the Premiership. He's on their team. Uh, Connor Wallace Sims, who was in the Exeter Academy once upon a time, played with the likes of Sam Simmons. Uh, what else have we got here? But then in turn, but on the whole, this is actually one of the teams that's kind of got the more homegrown talent. Um, I mean, if we're looking here, I mean, there's so many American internationals on this roster. Nate Brakely, he's probably a key one. Nick Cavetta, who played in the Premiership for many years, uh, as well as the Championship as well. Carl, Carl Sumison. 
Uh, but then also these kind of intriguing players, which is your, your Will Leonard's, your um, Harry Bennett's, your Connor Buckley, Buckley's, who, who was part of the uh, inaugural MLR draft, but didn't get drafted and then still wound up at his hometown club. So that's quite an exciting thing. Dylan Fawcett, the USA hooker, who, who usually comes off the bench in order to support uh, Joe Tafete. He's there as well. Um, they've got a Brazilian tight head prop called Wilton Rebello. It's just an exciting squad. And actually... Maybe my assessments haven't been completely right in that there is, you know, there is a still strong, there is still a strong base of a squad there. Uh, they've also got Troy Lockyer uh, and Chris Matina, who all plays, who both play centre, and they've also got Quinn and Guati, who uh, did play for the Toronto, what was it called, the Toronto Wolfpack in in you know in, in in rugby league. So again, that that's an exciting prospect in itself. I think they're going to go well this season. My only thing is, I don't know how they're going to adjust to, to having had the the coaching change. But as I said, they they they're playing San Diego team in Nevada. A bit confusing. I think everyone kind of is aware of this, but Chris Robshaw signed for them after the conclusion of the last Premiership season. So I'm you know I think as as someone who's English or and supports England, I'm naturally quite excited to see what he does and. Every interaction that I've ever had with Chris has been is really really good. So I have no doubt that he's going to succeed there. Um, what else have we got written down here? I've I've made some notes. Um, but then again, this is a team that we've largely seen for the last couple of years. Joe Peterson's back. Um, Dean Muir's back. But then they've got these exciting additions like your Cecil Africa's, like your Bjorn Bassons. You you know. It's just exciting. To me, it's just exciting. It's just an exciting team. They've got Aaron Mitchell, who's a prop that I know they rate so highly. Um, Chris Bauman, they've got Nate Augsburger, they've got Ryan Matias, uh, Josh Teal, Sam Wuching. You know, they, they, again, they do have this base of American players, which actually is so exciting. It's going to be very exciting to watch. Patrick Madden, who's one of their, um, he, he was a draft pick of theirs and I know that he's a proper California rugby success story so again another really bloody exciting thing we've got going on there um and then they're coached by coached by Scott Murray who used to coach uh, sorry no used to represent Scotland and then also they've got Zach Test who uh, was a sevens player went to the uh, 2016 Olympic Games then if we move to New England sorry I'm going to try and get through these quickly because I think my phone's about to die and that's what I record them uh, so anyone wondering. Okay, New England Free Jacks under new coaching management. Contradiction, I think. Um, Ryan Martin, who has coached Otago in the past. They're captained by Josh Larson, the Canadian international. You might remember him. He got sent off against someone in the World Cup. I think it was South Africa in the World Cup. Let me just take a look at this team because actually uh, it feels like it's been a long time since I've been, even seen this team. And they did make so many kind of exciting additions to the squad in the off season. Uh, yeah, Harry Barlow used to play for Quinns. Dougie Fife, Scotland international. What else have we got written down here? There's some, there's some really exciting players in here. I think um, Vian Conradi, who who played for Namibia, Namibia at the last World Cup. Tara Mtembu, who um, has capped in the Sharks in the past in Super Rugby. So that's quite an exciting signing, especially when you think about that. And then Jack Ram, he's played for Coventry in the, in the uh, Championship at Bowdoin Waka. You know played sevens for New Zealand. Um, again, another really exciting prospect that they've got there. And what I take from looking at their team, if you often go on to something like uh, your Wikipedia's, for example, so many of their players have not got these bold connotations that they're international players or even that they've got these, um, or even have Wikipedia pages themselves. So I think it's exciting to see that they've recruited so heavily from their local area. And I think that can only serve them well in the long run, especially when you consider that they haven't even played a home game yet. That keeps the excitement there. Like someone like Danny Collins, for example, proper Boston local lad, that's going to bring guys to the stadiums, uh, guys and girls to the stadiums when they eventually open. And also, another player who I think is really exciting is Kensuke Hatakeyama, who um, is the Japanese prop who uh, played at the 2015 World Cup and contributed to Japan's win over um, South Africa. In, in Brighton. I've mentioned that twice. I never get the opportunity to mention that twice. Uh, then we move to Los Angeles, uh, which is the newest team. And I, I will only really briefly mention this because obviously I've got a chat with Sean a little later on. Um, they, again, have brought in so many, so many guys from the local area. I think that's an important thing to do. But then they've also recruited quite heavily from Australia. I know that the coaches are from Australia. 
I know that the management's from Australia, so that's probably quite a normal thing to have happened. Um, in terms of the Australians they brought in, I mean, I think we don't go much further than Matt Gitto and Adam Ashley Cooper. So if we just take that as the as the as what we're working with, that's quite exciting itself. Then bringing DTH van der Merwe, a Canadian international, done pretty much everything there is to do in the game. Uh, then you look at your, you know, there's just so many internationals in this squad. Nick Boyer, who's played for, um, he's, he played for Glendale last season. He's also played for San Diego. Or was it San Diego last season and Glendale? I might have got that slightly wrong, but I do apologise. Um, but then they brought in Bill Meeks, who's playing the Premiership this season. They brought in JP and Ruan Smith from um, the Reds. This is an exciting team. The only thing is how quickly do they gel? Because I think that we, we can talk all we like about the big names and all this, that and the other. But until we actually see them on the pitch, what does that realistically add up to? Um, then what else have we got next? And obviously I'll, I'll my interview with Sean will be at the end and that will just be before I finish. Uh, Toronto. Right, okay. So for those that don't know, I'm born in Mississauga, Ontario. That is kind of a, a town that borders the Toronto, you know, the, the city of. And... This is a team, to me, that hasn't changed too much. I'd probably argue that it's like 80%, maybe 85% of the squad that was there last season. Lucas Rumble is still captaining the team. They've still got Manuel Diana from Uruguay. They've still got Thomas, Thomas De La Vega uh, from Argentina. And, yeah, he, he did play last season. I wasn't, going, I wasn't going completely mental there. They've got Mike Shepard. They've got Paul Chiellini. You know, Andrew Quatran, who, who was so important to them last year. I don't think we can actually really <laughs> even slightly talk about well, try and say that he wasn't. Uh, Will Kelly, the fly half, really nice guy as well. He might actually be watching this. Hi, Will. Um, Jamie McKenzie, who's played in England for Isha once upon a time. Taylor Adams, who who's a New Zealand, a Kiwi fly half who played them last season. And to me, was so important in terms of just keeping the ball alive so much. Yeah, again, and then you look at the, some of the players they brought in. They've been, uh, they brought in Jock Ryan Tugelet, who, brilliant player for Argentina. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, Gaston Mieres, uh, Leandro Levas, and yeah, it's an exciting team. And then Gaston Cortez, who's played for both Bristol and Leicester Tigers, as well as Glasgow Warriors once upon a time. Yeah, again, really exciting team. I think the consistency might be the key thing here, and just for them to to kind of build on something that was there last season, because they only lost the once, and it was a last minute kind of deal. So. Again, excited to see what Toronto do. And that, that probably shouldn't be a surprise considering that, uh, in many ways, they are my local team. They're playing Atlanta, who um, are captained by another Canadian. They're captained by Matt Heaton. But then in terms of people to look out for, Chance Wengluski, I probably said that wrong. Sorry, Chance. Um, what else have we got here? Harry Higgins. They've got, you, you know, your Ross Deacons. You've got Connor Keyes, who's another Canadian. You've got Alex Morn and yeah. And this is a team that it seems to have the ecosystem already sorted out because it's so well connected to Life University. A lot of these guys play for Life University, have gone elsewhere and come back because the general manager, forward slash head coach, um, Scott Lawrence, he he headed up that program for such a long time. So he knows what he's getting with these players. He knows what he's bringing in. Um, and he yeah, so he knows what he's bringing in and they want to play for him. And he, everything that I've ever heard about Scott has been overwhelmingly positive. And that's not a bad thing at all. That's a bloody brilliant thing. That's a bloody brilliant thing. So, I, you know, I look forward to that again because they had a decent start to life in MLR before last season was obviously cut short for, again, obvious reasons. That's an exciting one. I'm really kind of... Uh, if you can't tell, I'm excited for this season. It's so good. It's, it's such a good comp. And then Seattle Seawolves at the Houston Sabercats. Seattle, uh, the two-time champions, obviously last season was a, a bit of a dead rubber, so they are still the reigning champions, which is, you know, mental to say, considering that, you know, last season didn't really take place. Uh, former Wasps and London Irish centre slash wing, Ross Neal is a vice captain this season, which I'm, again, and the word is excited. I'm excited here. They've also brought back Brad Tucker, Eric Duchelle, uh, Andrew Giratalo, and so many players that have come back that have actually won back-to-back -back titles with this team so yeah it, it's it's a decent decent team when you look at the talent they've been able to maintain uh, to retain and and just bring back for another cracker a ring so you know for for those that are watching you broad matthew turner who used to play for england sevens he's in the team uh jake and mickey and justice sears juru who both i think have spent time in england as justice? Yes, he spent time with Ealing. 
uh, between 2017 and 2018, as well as Glasgow. Once upon a time, yeah, that's yeah, that's right. Bloody hell, that seems a long time ago now. Five years ago for him, he's only 26. Um, so yeah, they're, they're a really good team, uh, and they've they've kind of actually managed to maintain their coach, uh, who's a guy called Keith Lansing, and that's so important because for the first two years it changed. Actually, in the first year they were coached by Phil Mack, who's just now just just coaching as opposed to playing as well. Um, so it's good for them to have that consistency throughout and. I think because even though last season didn't go as well for them, I think the time off has probably actually helped them. They'll be better mates. They'll be, you know, they'll be able to 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 potentially build something. You can't ever say anything with with Seattle because you don't actually know sometimes which Seattle team's going to turn up, which actually makes them really bloody dangerous. Um, Houston SaberCats, uh, who are their hosts on Saturday. I know that Ben Sema of Seattle is shaving his hair off today for charity. Uh, so I hope that has gone well because otherwise um, it could be a bit of a mess, couldn't it? Um, right, again, so Houston are, and I'm sorry because I know I've got guys that play for Houston that follow me, they have not performed to the level that, to the standards that they expect to themselves. Paul Healy, he had a very short kind of, he had a very short kind of spell last season and it didn't go great. But for me, they still have them still having Duet De, Duet Roos, sorry, Duet De Roos, that's not a name. Uh, Duet Roos and Sam Windsor as their halfbacks. I think that's going to be really beneficial to them going forward because, you know, it's not because they're Australian, but it's, it's in terms of they know each other really well. And I think that's going to be really beneficial to them. Uh, Robbie Povey, he was brought in. Uh, it was a bit of a, it was a draft trade, I think that was for him. So again, bringing in a bit of talent who North American talent as well uh, and then elsewhere it's not a team and oh, I'm gonna get slammed for this it's not a team that's packed the rafters of with American internationals the internationals that are there are generally from elsewhere like Diego Fortuny for example or um, they've got a, I'm not gonna say I, I, they've got a, they've got a Georgian prop called Mika Katiashvili yeah, I can't go with that. But then they've also brought in guys that are so kind of known in the American rugby landscape, such as Taylor Howden or uh, your, Luke, your Luke Beauchamps or... Uh, oh, no, Luke. Is Luke? No, no, I'm, I might be going mad with Luke. I do apologise. Yeah, I've gone absolutely mental there. He's been, he's been with MLR, in MLR since 2019. Diego Magno, I know he's watching this. Diego. And he said Buenos Noches, which is good night. I can't remember what good luck is in Spanish. Uh, but that's what I'm wishing you. Um, but yeah, again... A few players that have come back, obviously they've got that hunger from playing in the t with the team previously. So I think, I hope for better horizons for them uh, this season because I know how hard, I know just, I know how hard they work on a day-to-day -day basis through speaking to Sam and, and Diego. It, it, it's so obvious how, how much they want to succeed with that team. And then we look at Utah. Now, instantly straight off the bat with Utah, my pal... Uh, Paul Mullen, he's moved to Utah this season from San Diego. I'm having some con connectivity issues uh, for some reason, and now my notes will not open. There we go. Um, yeah, so they brought in Paul. They brought in Olive Khalifi, who's another USA international prop. But then, on the whole, it's not a team, again, that's changed too much, which is another beneficial thing to them. And the, the, the big thing that's changed for them is that... Oh, excuse me. Um, the, the, the big thing that's changed for them is that... Chris Latham, who's a former Wallaby, played sevens at Commonwealth Games and this, that and the other. Um, he he left the team like a bit like Greg, uh, not too long before the start of the season, which means Sean Pittman, who who has worked for the national team, the US national team before, that means that he is he is now head coach, which to be fair isn't really a bad thing. There's a bit of consistent consistency, therefore the players, um, in order to progress. So if I'm if I'm kind of like giving a bit of a judgment on them from that from that standpoint, then I think they're gonna be okay. I think if they do what I think will be best for them, and I'm not saying that they have to listen to me, but I think with the forwards they've got, there's no reason that they can't have one of the most dominant packs in the league. There's just no reason. There's just no reason why not. Um, you know, Matt Jensen at Locke, he he's pretty dominant in the air and things like that. They've got you know, they've got they've they've got a a lot called Matthew Je Matthew Dalton, sorry, Matthew Jensen, as I nearly said, who, who used to play for Ulster, and um, a guy called Aston 
Paul Chuin, who, who's a South African. With those guys running a line out, and then you've got your props like your, your Pauls, your Alex Tucci's, and your Franco Van Denbergs, there's no reason they can't have one of the most dominant packs in there. It's just about whether or not they do it, I suppose, because I think Olive and Paul are two of the best scrummages in the league, and they play for the same team. I think if you watch any San Diego games last season when Paul was playing, just watch some of his scrummaging. It's genuinely it's spine shuddering. Uh, they're taking on Austin. At, what is the Austin ground called? I can't actually remember. I can't remember. Genuinely can't remember. I should know. It's 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 a very iconic venue. It makes me feel very silly that I do not remember. What is that venue called? Well, I've written it down. Bold Stadium. Oh, I've had a shocker there. Now I'm going to start off with a local lad, Cam Dodson. I live in Staffordshire. Cam is from Staffordshire. Cam. All the best. That's all I've got for that. Uh, but then also they've got Will McGee, who's going to be playing fly half. Bryce Campbell, he's, you know, played for London Irish. Uh, Sebastian de Chavez, who's played for both London Irish and uh, Newcastle Falcons, my very own Newcastle Falcons. They've got Jamie McIntosh, former New Zealand prop. They've got, they 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 have really recruited well. They've got Frank Halley, Jeff Hassler. They've got Cole Davis. Someone's breaking in through the front door. Uh, Pele Cowley. They've got Dom Aquino, who is literally one of the poster boys for this team. Zinzani Lamputic, who's a US qualified South African player. He's he's actually one of the most important players in terms of his versatility, but then also his leadership. Um, what else have we got here? Blah, 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 blah. I think I'm going mad. Louis Sitama, who's one of their draft picks. Connor Mooneham, who was meant to be playing for the Dallas Jackals, but then as part of a dispensary draft sort of situation, he's now gone to Austin. But for a kid from from Texas, I'm sure he's just happy to be staying in his home state, to be honest. Paddy Ryan, really good USA international prop as well. Lerone White is someone that I quite enjoy watching. His scrummaging, but then also what he does in the loose is actually quite good. Christine Osterberg, also a very important player for them. Already, I've noticed, having played for Oralac and then also Chinna uh, once upon a time as he tried to progress his rugby career, but moved back just before COVID and after a pretty nasty run of injuries. I'm sorry, I've rambled on at you guys for far too long, which means you only have to put up with me for a couple more minutes before you see me and Sean. Well, no, weren't my last two games, uh, two teams, sorry, I can't even remember. Old Glory DC. Again, we didn't get to see too much of them last season, but Jason Robertson, their fly half, Robertson, sorry, their fly half is one of the best goal kickers that I think in the league probably. He's definitely up there. You know, he did so much for them and he was so important in the way that they went about business when they joined the competition. It's so difficult to win games of rugby. It's so difficult to be the better team. But when you have a guy like that, who when you get off the opportunity for points, who will just literally say, yeah, I'll do it. And you have that faith in him to do so. That's so important to them. But then they've also got Danny Tusitala, the scrum half. So that makes for a really decent halfback pairing in order to pull the strings there. But then let's see what else we've got here. Mongo Mason, the flank, who's played a bit of Sco uh, sevens for Scotland. Uh, what else we've got here? Threaten Palamo, who played for Bristol over the years. Kieran Hearn, London Irish again. Doug Fraser, Canadian international. Jamie Deaver, who's played for Canterbury, which is a rather interesting one for me. Um, when they were in National 1. He's also played for Cambridge as well. I didn't actually know that. That's interesting. But this is also his third MLR team. So he knows the state and he knows what to do. He knows, you know, he knows this game. Uh, who else would I look out for? I would look out for Jack Iscaro, prop. Very, very good player um, from, from all the counts. Went to Gonzaga High School, you know, in, in D.C. and uh, in Washington, sorry, not D.C. Yeah, he, so he went to... He went to Gonzaga, then he went to Cal, you, you know, which is the university program that's produced uh, the likes of Blaine Scully. We'll, we'll use him as the kind of the benchmark for that brilliant USA international, really good guy as well. Um, what else have we got here? Ah, I'm going mental. This is, you know, I'm. If you can't tell, I'm just buzzing. I'm just buzzing for this. And the Nola Gold, who are no me by no means last or least, least, but they are last. Yeah, I messed that one up. One of the deepest rosters that I think that are in this competition. Um, where do we start? Honestly, where do we start? JP Eloff at fullback. Good goal kicker. Also pretty decent if you put him in at fly half. Uh, uh, I mean, if we just look at draft picks, Brian Knowlton, Andrew Guerra, Malcolm May, he's really good. Moni Tongoia. You can look through this team and see guys that could potentially get international honours in the future. Uh, but then they've also been in T Timothy Gillamar, who has played in MLR for years now, since the start. He played for Austin, then he played for New England, now he's with NOLA. 
So he's done. He, he he's a really good goal kicker, a good good playmaker as well. But they also do have Robbie Coleman. The did he gain from Australian caps? I can't even remember. He got sevens caps. It wasn't from international caps. Um, honestly, th this again is another team that that can do something. This is a team that because they have that familiarity and they also have you know so many um, so many really exciting players. It, yeah, I, I don't see why they couldn't do something again. And that's what makes the competition so good because as much as we've got these East and West conferences, there's pretty much every week you can't turn around and say, oh, this team's definitely going to win or this team's definitely going to win, especially after the year out because we don't actually know what to expect so early on because some guys could be sharp, some guys might not be sharp. And that is another thing that adds to the intrigue of Major League Rugby for 2021. But yeah, I mean, like you've heard me rambling. You've had me rambling for nearly half an hour now. Thank you very much for watching this. But before you leave, here is my interview with Sean McNulty of the LA Guiltinis talking all things LA. Um, yeah, enjoy that. To talk about the newest team in Major League Rugby, I've been joined by a man who spent the majority of his time on the East Coast, has now swapped time zones and swapped jerseys in order to represent the newest team on the block. It's Sean McNulty of the LA Guillotine. It's Sean, how are you? Hey Joe, uh, yeah, pretty, really well. Can't complain. Um, thanks for having me on. Happy to have a chat. No, it's all right. And I'm sure that you've got plenty of stuff to say about the LA Guillotine. I suppose the first question is, what was the attractiveness about moving coasts and becoming part of this new team in MLR? It's the second time you've been part of a new team as well. Yeah, yeah second, second time I've been part of a new team. Um, what attracted me? Um, Obviously, my brother has signed on here as well. Um, so when I was uh, kind of in the off season, he was starting to talk to a couple of teams in the MLR, look at his options, and that did um, get me thinking a little bit about maybe joining up with him for a year or two. Just you know, to play professional rugby with my brother is a, a bit of a once in a lifetime thing. Um, and I was just at a stage in my career where I kind of just needed a little bit of a change, um, and. Yeah, just I think it all just kind of came at a good time and, and, and fell into place. Yeah, and yeah. and personally for for me, that's I, the only I think the only person I've spoken to at LA, other than yourself and your brother, is I think the only person I've spoken to is is Dave Dennis, and that was before yep. all of the all of the 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 money signings. Is that the way of phrasing it? it possibly is. You know, the kind of the big <laughs> names that are taking all the headlines yep. is what I'm trying to say. Um, for sure. But when you look at LA as a whole, you look at California. We all know it's a bit of a hotbed for rugby talent. You yeah. know, when you when you look at the local guys that you have on the roster and you've interacted with already, played a game with as well, a couple of games with already, um, is it is LA more than just the big names that everyone's going to talk about anyway? Because it seems like there's a real bed of local talent there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, of course, the big names are going to get the headlines, but um, you know we're putting a really big emphasis on growing the game um, in in the community. There's already, like you said, a really really strong rugby background rugby kind of like you say hotbed of talent in LA and um you know as you can see with with the American guys that we've signed a lot of them are actually from LA or the California region they're local homegrown guys and you know they're gonna be really key uh for us and you know connecting in the community you know we're gonna try and set up camps and underage academies and stuff like that and um really just kind of tap into the resources that are already here in LA because there is so much already yeah and I know obviously as I've mentioned previously for people that don't know Sean's brother Harry played for Ireland Sevens um, for, for many many years he was one of the original members of that squad that eventually reached the World Series um, and I know from speaking to him that you know you guys have spent time living in America anyway growing up uh, yeah, yeah was that was that in New York yeah so we spent um, about 10 years in New York yeah so I moved over when I was just after I was born I was about six or seven months old and I stayed till I was 11 yeah so that was really cool growing up in, in America yeah yeah, that's kind of one of the things. You see America as home, as much as the accent might not be the, the classic New Yorker that you're expecting. You mm -hmm. you think of America as home anyway, don't you? Um, probably a mix. It, it's a funny question when people ask me where I'm from. It kind of depends on who I'm talking to. I change my answer up a little bit. Some people I'm from Dublin, and then if I'm in Ireland, I have to explain a little bit more that I grew up in New York and then spent a bit of time here and there. So uh, definitely feel really, really connected to America from from my up, up growing or um and that's kind of one of the reasons I actually came to the MLR when I finished up in Leinster. I was kind of just like, you know, it's, it is pretty cool. I have a lot of friends that I grew up with still all in New York and I see them, you know, all the time. So it definitely still is the connection. Uh, my parents moved back to America a couple of years ago as well. So uh, they were in Boston whilst I was in the Free Jack. So that was pretty nice as well. 
Oh God, I can only imagine. And for you, what, what, you know, you, you mentioned that you finished up at Leinster. How yeah. much were you personally in need of a new challenge? Because I can imagine that, you know, after being with Leinster for so long, it must have been nice to have a bit of a refresh. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so when I came out of Leinster, I I was looking at rugby rugby stuff a bit, but at, at the same time, I was kind of looking at, you know, maybe just not playing rugby and kind of just starting into the real world, as some people say. Um, but I was only 22 or 23, so I took actually the whole summer off, and I, funnily enough, went back to New York for that whole summer. And by the end of the summer, I kind of was... I decided, oh, look, I'm only 22, 23. There's, there's no point packing in the rugby now. MLR is literally just taken off. I kind of saw the potential in it. And um, through a, quite a good family friend in Greg McWilliams, who was actually the, the USA backs coach at the time, probably still is, um, met him for coffee in New York and stuff. And that kind of got the ball rolling for me to come, come to America. And yeah, it's been unbelievable since. And how much you know, since you first became involved with, because uh, obviously you played for New England, but then I, you went on loan for a period, didn't you, with, with um, New York. You know, yeah. how much has the competition grown since your kind of, your first footsteps into it? Oh, massively. So that loan deal kind of came around. Um, I signed to the Free Jacks the year that they were an expansion team. So they weren't actually competing in the league full time. Um, they were just building a squad of pretty much all their local Boston talent, getting them in for a season just to train. They did a couple of exhibition games, stuff like that. Um, but I was pretty, itch I was itching to kind of, you know, play some competitive matches and stuff. So once Boston or the Free Jacks had finished their initial kind of trial period and stuff, I, I sought to go on loan uh, to Rooney in New York, who were actually competing in the league. So I went down there for the last five games. Um, I was actually just coming up a hamstring injury. So it was, it was perfect timing for me to just get, you know, four or five games under the belt before the season finished up. Um, and then, yeah, obviously last year, uh, before COVID hit, unfortunately, we only got five games in. But, um, yeah, the, the league is, it, it's ready to take off um, genuinely. You can see, all, you know, there's big names coming in. There's, you know, there's a lot of talent from abroad. But even the American talent, um, you know, they're getting so upskilled by having all these um, kind of the international experience coming in. That it's actually the, the domestic talent that's probably benefiting the most, which is cool. Yeah, I think it's what's kind of noticeable is that the teams that you've been at, they all kind of have that local bed of talent available. And I think it's it is definitely the case with all the teams anyway. Generally, they are literally based in the rugby hotspots of the United States of America. But you mm -hmm. mentioned they're bringing in big names. Like let's, I mean, you were at New York, you had Ben Foden, you know, and then yeah. we we talk now about. Let's just talk about the Guiltinis. Let's talk about the team that the LA, the, the team that the LA Guiltinis have put together. You've got some pretty special names that you're going to be playing with this season. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, I'm sure, yeah, you've seen the the team sheet of the the, the squad that we have. Um, it's incredibly cool, you know. For me, um, you know, I, the old cliche. I grew up watching these lads, but you know, I genuinely did. Um, you know, Matt Gitto, Adam Ashley Cooper, Dave Dennis. Uh, DTH Vandermeer, like there's there's a lot of international experience there, you know, a couple of World Cups, stuff like that. So um, they're legends of the game, and it's yeah, it's pretty cool for me to uh, to share a dressing room with them. Yeah, I can only imagine. And you know what? I saw images of this dressing room yesterday. So for those that don't know, Sean, his brother, and all the LA Guild teams were playing at the pretty iconic LA Coliseum this season. And yeah. firstly, what a venue! You know, it's incredible. <laughs> Yeah, it, genuinely incredible. Yeah, so we, we did our first ever training session there yesterday. Um, obviously, have our first home match there this weekend. So went down just to get a bit of a run out. And I mean, it could easily be, uh, the grass there could easily be in Augusta at the Masters. Like it's like a golf course almost. It's just the nicest pitch I've ever been, been on. And then, you know, you just look around and, um, you know, the archway above with the Coliseum sign where, you know, the torch was at the Olympics, like stuff like that. It's just, you know, unbelievably iconic like you said I think you saw the dressing room it's like plastered with USC kind of hall of fame all around like just really 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 cool yeah so um we all can't wait to get out there this weekend and you know make it a bit of a fortress hopefully you know it's our home venue I think for the next five years we've signed on for and you know we want to make it a place that we're you know proud to play proud to play at and represent the city of LA so it's cool yeah, and, and for those that don't know, the Coliseum is literally, I think it's 90 plus thousand seats of stadium, I think. I might be going yeah, I think it's mental up around, No, I think it's up around 88, 92, something like that, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, 
pretty crazy. And it, the one thing I noticed was pretty cool is uh, the seats are like right on the sidelines. So it, it's a massive stadium, but it actually feels quite enclosed as well. So um, obviously with COVID, I don't know how much uh, support we're allowed in, but it would be nice to think that someday down the line, we'll get a couple thousand in there and, and get a bit of noise going. Oh yeah, and it, and it's such a sign of intent for a team that's that's so fresh and is introducing rugby to a completely new market. Because I think for for those that are a bit of sports nauses like me, essentially you would have seen when the LA Rams moved back to LA after being in St Louis or St Louis. Yeah. I can't remember actually how to say it. I, I did a lot of French when I was younger, so I just it's say me. St Louis. <laughs> um, that's my logic for things generally, anyway. Um, that's where the LA Rams were playing originally when they first moved back. If there's a video of James Corden, I think doing some sort of I want to say cheerleading routine there. So if you actually find oh, that, that's yeah, probably yeah. a good representation of actually how <laughs> big that stadium is. And it was yeah. actually where the, I think it was, it wasn't Hard Knocks. It was um, the other TV show where they followed the team around for that entire first year. Um, what's it called? Uh, all or Nothing. All or Nothing, that's the one. The All or Nothing on Amazon, yeah. Yeah. So so if, if you want to get a, a scale of how big that stadium is, watch something like that and it will give you an idea. And it's, it's, um, is where Pete Carroll coached for many years. I could probably mm -hmm. reel off far more than I probably should be able to as someone that lives <laughs> in the UK. Yeah. Um, but it's an iconic venue and it it looks incredible. Um, yeah. And you're playing there this weekend. You're playing your former team. That That's one way to start yeah. off the team's history. But actually, firstly, quickly before then, you guys were in Texas at the weekend. Yep. Yeah, we went down to Austin. Um, so they're obviously owned by the same ownership group as us. So uh, went down and played them um, in what was it? Yeah, it was our only real kind of preseason hit out, um, which is good. Came away with the win, um, last minute mall try. Always nice to keep keep people on their seats. Um, but it was good. It was good. You know, some people haven't played in 12 months, 14 months. Uh, some people played a little bit more recently, but uh, it was good to kind of shake off the cobwebs, get the combinations going. And just um, I think boys were just happy to be playing rugby again. You could see it in the dressing room, a um, couple of sing songs, stuff like that. It was, it was nice, yeah, nice to get it back out. And, and what's it kind of been like for you the last 12 months? Because I can imagine for, for people that commit themselves so much to a sport or to anything in life, to have that kind of stripped away from you for, for such a long period, was it hard or were you kind of always in the back of your head knowing that eventually at some point it would come back? No, it was pretty tough. Yeah, it was pretty tough because we were... Um, just to give a path that we were preparing for our first ever home game in Boston last year. So those five games we played last year were on the road. And then it was, uh, yeah, it was our first home game. It was Paddy's weekend in Boston. You know, it was just, it was just a huge weekend. So um, I think they pulled the plug on like the Tuesday of that week. And then the following Monday, we were all told we had to move home pretty, pretty uh, instantly. So I was on a flight the next day back to Dublin in full lockdown. It was like, oh, what the hell am I going to do now? And, you know, it was, I guess the uncertainty, you don't really know how long it was going to last. Um, so that was March. And then I didn't play again. I was lucky enough to be invited to the Bermuda Tens in October. So that's the only bit of rugby I've played since uh, since the MLR finished last year. So it was, it was a funny old year. Gosh. So I can only yeah. imagine the, the pent-up... Ooh, what's the correct words to use? I don't want to say aggression because that seems like you're going to be, you know, knocking the seven down. I mean, which you will, to be fair. But, you know, in terms of you're playing New England, your former team, obviously a bit of a different setup this year. Obviously, you you, you will know a lot of the names there anyway. Um, what's yeah. it like? What's it going to be like taking on your former employers in a sense? Um, yeah, I'm excited. Look, um, well, our team's actually not even announced yet. So uh, we'll have to wait and see if I'm involved first and foremost. Um it's obviously a game I'd love to be involved in. Like you said, um, I know a few of them pretty close uh, from last year. Um, but it, there's a fairly strong turnover as well. Um, there might only be about five, maybe five from the starting team who would be there. It's a whole new head coach. So there's a bit of change. But again, um, you know, I'm, I'm still pretty good friends with, they just announced their captain and vice captain and Josh Larson, Bodie and Waka. So um yeah, just if I'm lucky enough to be involved, uh, rip in for however long I'm on the pitch for, and then uh, hopefully, you know, have a beer with them in the dressing room after um, and just catch up. But no, nah, really, really uh, looking forward to this one, yeah. Oh, certainly. And obviously, wish you all the best with, with the game because I can only imagine what it's going to be like, mm -hmm. you know, playing in that stadium. I'm hoping, I'm trying to work out time difference in my head right now very quickly. There might be sun out as well. So for anyone watching abroad, you might get to see some sun, which we've not really seen in quite a long time now. Um, but, you know, 
when when we talk about any new team or any sports team, it, it transcends what happens on the pitch on a Saturday or a Sunday, for example. What what becomes a successful first season for for the Guiltini? Is it is it assessed on the pitch of what the first team do, or is it you know maybe engaging new audiences with these camps that you're talking about before? Um, I think there's two ways to answer that. Um, we're obviously a really ambitious playing group, so you know we're not here just to you know make up the numbers in year one. We're like I said, we're really ambitious, and we're coming here to win a trophy in year one. That's the that's our goal. Um, and then the second side of that is what is success is, um, yeah, like we said, we want to grow the game. LA is a, one, a huge rugby, um, we said we're hotbeds or community, but two, just sporting in general. It's, you know, it's the sporting capital of the world, if, if, if you like, um, just with the franchises they have. So um, it's cool that we're the first team to play fresh rugby in LA. So we, we're lucky enough to kind of set the... I guess the culture or um, build the brand in the community, stuff like that, get the word out there. And again, the, the success on the pitch correlates, I guess, with uh, kind of tapping into a new market, hopefully as well. Um, so yeah, it, it, there's two sides to it. We're, we're really excited for this. <laughs> uh, we're excited for this year, yeah. No, I think everyone's really excited because again, like as we've mentioned before, MLR has been gone for... I think it would literally be 50, I want to say 53 weeks, roughly. Yeah, I was literally just looking at it. I think it was potentially last weekend last year that uh, it was all done up. So, yeah, people are itching to go. Yeah, I can actually remember where I was. I was in a, oh, God. Uh, for anyone watching in America, you might not know this place. Um, or in North America, <laughs> I should say, as well, because we'll, there will be Canadians watching this. Um, I was in a place called Nando's um, in Stevenage. Oh, I don't live near Stevenage. I was in Stevenage. <laughs> there we go. Um, and I was in a Nando's in Stevenage when I found out. So that seems a long time ago. I have had Nando's yeah. since. It's not as good as I remember, <laughs> actually. Um, uh, Sean, first, I, I want to say, obviously, and I know I've said it before, all the best with this weekend. It's, you know, it, you. it's going to be tremendously exciting to see what the LA Guillotines get up to this season. Um, and I suppose last question. I mean, how long has it taken to grow that moustache? That is actually the last question. That, that is <laughs> I knew it was going to come up. I knew it was going to come up. Uh, it always does. It's just because I, I clean shaved around the face yesterday, so it's popping out a bit more now. Um, yeah, it kind of just started. Um, I, I do Movember every year, which is obviously uh, raising a bit of money in November. And then this year, I was kind of just like, leave it grow. Um, I kind of like it. You know, it's the old cliche. It's grown on me since, you know, so. Um, yeah. Well, I like it. No, I'm a fan. Harry grows a good mustache as well. It's obviously very good genes in your family. <laughs> yeah, for, for some reason, the mustache grows a lot thicker than the beard. I have a real patchy beard, so I never get too much more than a stubble, but my mustache grows quite thick. And then Harry usually has a bit more of a face on him as well. But um, yeah, I don't think our parents are too happy with the looks, but it's a bit of crack. So. Yeah, it definitely is. I mean, you know, I mean, what I'll say to your parents is at least your children can grow mustaches. Um, <laughs> Sean, thank you so much for joining me on this. It literally is an as yet untitled MLR show. That's probably probably going to be the name. This is how early we are in the days of this. And Happy days. Yeah, Sean, honestly, thank you so much. Um, and you can follow Sean. Uh, yeah, you can follow me on Instagram, I guess, at Sean McNulty underscore, or I guess on Twitter at Sean McNulty5. Um, some very, very average content there for you. <laughs> now I'm only yes and that. Yeah, sure, give us a follow. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, this is my first attempt at my as yet untitled MLR show. I really hope you enjoyed watching it. I'm sorry it's been so long. I didn't expect it to be this long at all, which is, uh, well, well, it's quite embarrassing really, isn't it? But yeah, no, honestly, thank you so much for watching. I hope you <laughs> managed to put on these games wherever you are. Um, if you're abroad, the best place to do that is get the Rugby Network, which is powered by Rugby Pass. And if, you know, on top of that, if you download the Major League Rugby app as well, you can read my articles, which isn't the greatest sell, I don't think, for anything in the world. But in terms of me trying to sell it, that's how I'm going to do it for the rest of my life, basically. Um, thank you very much for watching this. Like, comment, subscribe, um, uh, follow me, whatever you're watching this on, I don't know. But yeah, thank you very much for watching. Enjoy your weekend, because I know I'm intruding on a Saturday. Um, thank you so much.